So a heartfelt welcome to you all. My name is Kathy Bishop and I'm the program head of the MA in Executive Leadership Program at Royal Roads University. I'm here with our executive leadership team. You'll see Victor Shuchak, Marcy Strong and, and Darren Levine along um, with, I'm delighted to say to be here to talk with Dr. Cindy Blackstock about the breath of life model that she developed and we're going to delve deeper into questions like, what is it? How did it come to be? Why is it important? And looking deeper at leadership, how might leaders draw upon the breath of life theory? What values can guide us and what might we want to consider utilizing? So to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Kosapsan and Lekwungen families upon which Royal Roads University resides and that we have the privilege to live, work, learn, and play. And also recognizing our virtual reality, I want to acknowledge the lands and peoples wherever you may be. Haitichka Siem. Haitichka Siem is a key phrase in the Lekwungen language, which means thank you, esteemed ones. And I humbly offer this phrase, recognizing that words are worlds and language affirms people and cultures. So, over to you, Cindy, for some opening remarks. Well, I'm delighted to join you. I join you from unceded Algonquin territory here in Ottawa. I am a proud member of the Gitsan First Nation in British Columbia, where I really, I spent my first 38 years. I only moved to Ottawa uh, because I was convinced I'd come here and I'd be able to uh, work with others to demonstrate to the federal government these inequalities in federal services and provide evidence-informed and economically-based solutions for ending those inequalities for kids and they would fix the problem but uh, they didn't and so here I am uh, many years later uh, but we're starting to see results from that what ended up to be litigation so lovely thank you well so great to have you and so why don't we just delve in then to what is the breath of life theory? Well, the breath of life is really all of the knowledge that's passed down from generation to generation in First Nations communities. Um, and it is uh, a knowledge that is very interdependent and very expansive across time and space. And so I grew up in the bush in Northern British Columbia. Um, my father was in the forest service, so we would literally be in the bush uh, or in very small communities that often even, didn't even make the definition of a town. Going to our reserve was like going to a big place for me. And I remember being a little kid and learning in the bush in a very different way than what I would confront in Western education. Um, when I'd be out, uh, huckleberry picking up in the huckleberry uh, patches in northern BC, we'd be uh, talking about the huckleberry bush, uh, you know, asked like how many things, what can you see with the bush? Well, you can see the leaves, you can see the stems, you can see the, the ripe huckleberries, the ones that are not so ripe, and uh, you go, uh, you can see water and all the rest of it. And then, you know, people would sweep away the dirt at the roots and say, you know, that's just what you can see, but look at all the important work down here and think about all the animals and all the light it absorbs in order to keep the plant going and all the water, you got all that interaction. Then I went to grade one, thankfully in a public school. Keep in mind residential schools were still operating when I was in grade one. Um, but I was convinced I was stupid, Kathy. I just, I thought, I don't get this. And then finally, I, I still remember the day leaving grade one and realizing that I had finally figured out how to be smart in Western education. And that was to uh, understand or say something that no one else could understand. Huh. That the, the less understood I was, the smarter I was in Western education. And that remained true up until my PhD. I mean, we actually have a system that curates knowledge so that those at the top of this uh, privilege of knowledge uh, are able to communicate in a way that you actually only have five or six committee members who can understand what you're saying. Uh, and I just, that just seems so, so obscure to me. Um, and as I began my own kind of um, 
PhD studies, I started looking at these Western theories that are often applied to First Nations. And I would hear people say, well, you know, we welcome new knowledge. And I think, yeah, but you only welcome new knowledge to the degree that someone else said it before. And that it often is saying it before equates to using Western theories. And I thought, I'm gonna do work on First Nations children. So I wanna go back to the huckleberry bushes mm -hmm. and see what I can find out there. Because that worldview that I was taught as a young girl and that was really dismissed uh, by Western education seemed to me to be a far better way of understanding the world than what I had learned in ecological theory or Maslow's hierarchy of needs or uh, critical theory or any of these other theories that we often apply. So that, that inspired the beginnings of what would be the breath of life theory. So fabulous. I mean, nature is such a great teacher. And I just really, you know, love what you said in terms of even like what's below the surface, because I think there's that's so rich, but also, you know, just, you know, what you said in terms of being the less understood, you know, the smarter you seem, I think, you know, that's why, you know, having a theory that you can apply and, and really be able to use is so important. And I'm, you know, I'm so, yeah, so delighted that you actually have taken this and moved it forward because uh, I've got this great image of the huckleberry bushes, especially coming from from you know being raised in you know in the Vancouver area. Um, I was in, raised in North Vancouver, so I definitely feel lots of connections. Anyways, please tell us more about the breath of life theory. So what I started to do in um, in my PhD studies is I have, I, I've got four degrees in four different disciplines. So I'm very interdisciplinary just as, a, as by nature. Um, but the, in my PhD studies, I, I took the opportunity because I was the only First Nations student in my class. And in fact, in all my academic uh, studies, I've been the only First Nations student in my class and I've never had a Indigenous instructor in all my degrees. I've got four different degrees. And I thought this is an opportunity. I can complain about this or I can use this as an opportunity. And so I was blessed with being having relationships with uh, knowledge keepers and indigenous peoples, uh, elders all over the world. So what I did is I kept a notebook about when I thought fundamentally differently than other people in my class. And I would write it down and then I would check it out with these knowledge keepers to see if it was just a Cindyism or whether it was some, one of those pieces that highlighted that very different framework of ontology that we were talking about. So it was through that process that I was able to get deeper meaning myself, like to not let myself off easy just saying the word balance, but saying, what does that mean? What's in balance, right? Yes. Over what time frame? is in balance, right? All of those questions I wanted to delve more deeply into. And so I ended up um, with the, the first kind of unpacking for me was being more clear about what this First Nation ontology meant. And I, when I say First Nation ontology, I mean very general, at a very general level. And how does that compare again, again against a very general view of ontology in social, in, in social sciences and Western academia? And so a couple of things just kind of highlighted for myself. One is that um, we believe that our ancestors are mostly right. And Western folks think their ancestors are mostly wrong. And that's why in Western academia, you privilege uh, new citations, for example. Uh, and even better, something coming around the corner. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a handicap that's already applied to that new knowledge because you have that bias versus for ourselves and remembering cultures, we actually think, you know what, um, caring for human beings, things like peace building, uh, science, those have been going on for tens of thousands of years. So maybe there is something that the people have figured out before us that we ought to really uh, take a good fresh look at, right? Um, so that's one. The other thing is multiple dimensions of reality. And I find it really interesting in Western science that they really are Western social sciences that they path, uh, pathologize um, multiple dimensions of reality or they, they make them into myths. Uh, but for First Nations folks, we've always known that there are multiple dimensions of reality and uh, that spirit and ceremony are a way of accessing those. 
And uh, we now know through Western physics, which I, I you draw on in this theory, because it is a Western knowledge-based system that is, that is really much closer to First Nations ontology than the social sciences are, because Western, uh, Western physics is delving after a theory of everything. And in Western physics, they've actually confirmed there are at least nine, maybe more dimensions of reality. So you have the, uh, the Western physics doing that, but because of the compartmentalization of Western knowledge, social sciences haven't even thought about that, right? And so that's another difference is a compartmentalization. When we talked about my grade one experience, it wasn't just being uh, not understood anymore that made you uh, uh, more of an expert. It was knowing less about the, the, the context of the world, the interdependence and honing in on one area. You're an expert in this discrete area and you become an expert and you often lose a sense of the context in which that's operating. So for us, that holism and then across time and space. So a longitudinal study in management or social science, I mean, you're, you, you get accolades if it's 20 years, but in our case, we have had um, rigorous systems of passing down knowledge that really test assumptions, test realities across generations for thousands of years. And that's how it's different. And uh, you know, people say, well, how can that be? And I always point them to the Delgamut case, which was brought by the Wissowatan and the Gitsan to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the, it was really a lands rights case. And what the BC government was saying is you don't have any more right to the land because you know you didn't exist before we saw you. You don't have anything in writing that says you were on these lands. This is the legal argument. And so the Gitsan and Witsotin said, no, we have oral history. And the question went to the Supreme Court. Is this oral history actually a legitimate, does it have the equal weight of written evidence? And the answer to that is yes, after the Supreme Court looked at it. So we have the Supreme Court of Canada in law affirming the validity of, um, of oral history. And let's face it, the law is one of those uh, items where you know oral history has to reach a particular threshold to be uh, accepted as evidence. They've accepted it, but the social sciences haven't caught up. So those are some of the differences. And so then taking all those differences in worldview, I thought, well, what would it look like if we had a model, a, a theoretical model that we could test and build from? And um, so that was the next step. Wonderful. And you know what? So, you know, so important to be able to put that out there because, as you said, social science models haven't caught up. And so, you know, even when you said when when you went through and did your you know, PhD, you were the only Indigenous student there. Mm -hmm. And and again, to being able to to one open up our education systems so that people aren't excluded, but are included and also have others there too. And the only way we can do that is by bringing in these different worldviews. So, 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 so again, deep appreciation for what you have done and what you're doing. So do you want to speak any more about, you know, how the breath of life theory came? <laughs> oh, I, um, I really believe in communal knowledge. And this is one area where I really will, uh, I wanted to make a departure from the way that social sciences uh, theories are developed. So uh, I wrote an article that actually shows how those ontological differences render things like critical theory, anti-oppressive approaches, incompatible with a First Nations ontology. So people can go check that out. Uh, but I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to take an experiment of actually kind of modeling something different for people to then build on, because I, I wanted this to be a communal uh, uh, theory building exercise because all the knowledge that I was applying here was gifted to me in a communal way. This wasn't just my thoughts. I was really trying my best to be a good messenger. Um, I don't think I succeeded all the time in carrying the, that richness of the message forward, but that was my attempt. And so um, I worked with a friend of mine, uh, Terry Cross from the Seneca Nation, who had developed these relational worldview principles which to me were much more aligned with um, First Nations ontology than the Western determinants of health. So uh, I took those, uh, those relational worldview principles and I said, these are the things that need to be in balance. 
and not just at an individual level, at a community level and at a, at a global level and not just um, for that one person or their family or even their nation, but across time and multi-generations and in a way that accounts and respects the multiple dimensions of reality. So you have now a system where these, for these First Nations determinants of health have me, I've gained meaning through looking back at the, at the generations of experience that came before that. So for example, if we took the water crisis in First Nations communities and you only looked at it in this finite piece of time and you didn't look back at what resulted in these communities not getting any water, then you wouldn't be getting a good understanding of that. And the breath of life theory requires that you do that work. It also requires you to say, we're in this point of time. If we take action A, what are the repercussions seven generations downstream, not just for myself or my family or the next generation, but for seven generations downstream, I am gonna be setting in place the echo that will be a lived reality for someone else. And then the other, uh, the way I dealt with diversity is I said, okay, it's kind of like string theory in physics, where uh, physics says, you know, they're all matter is really based from the same thing. It's a whole series of particles, and it's really how those strings of particles vibrate as to whether we get that uh, map behind you or whether you get someone like me. And so, in line with that, I kind of said, well, with the human diversity, it's Everyone does need food. Everybody does need water. Everyone has to, uh, has some level of spiritual existence, however they define that. The diversity comes through the vibrations of your culture and your context. And I use those two things together because I thought of myself, I thought, okay, here I am, I'm a Gitsan person, but I, um, so things that like, you know, the traditional foods and that are all good, but I live here in Ottawa and I've been affected by colonialism. So my reality is a bit different. Um, it's, it's been affected that way by those vibrations in the strings. Um, and that accounts for that diversity and honors that diversity. So uh, that's kind of the model in a nutshell. Um, and I really uh, was trying to be very clear when I published it, that this was an invitation for all of us to rethink the way that Western theory is conceptualized. Because I think it's so artificial to have these very narrow theories that only cuts a glimpse of the reality of that individual and very rarely takes account of their context or of their ancestors or of the future echoes of their behavior. So uh, that's what it's all about, is I'd like to see everyone working as they do in physics on a theory of everything, because I think that's the C I think that's what the ancestors knew before us. It made no sense to parse human existence away from everything else. Yes, you know, and and especially, you know, I think people are experiencing that in terms of times that are so emergent too. And we are now seeing how we're all connected. In the past, maybe people from a Western viewpoint wouldn't have seen that there's a connection or we could pretend that we're, you know, you know, of our own so selves. But you know, when the pandemic was declared in 2020, you know, we recognized, you know, pandemics, you know, don't get stopped by walls. They don't, you know, so to for us to recognize that we are all connected, but then to take in account context is so important in time. And to understand your own humility. Like that's something mm -hmm. else that I find very different in Western academia. I actually feel it kind of find it awkward when people want to award me for something. It's very kind and I, I appreciate it. But everything I do is collective and not just with the people I have the privilege of working with now, but those who I did before and the, the ancestors who pass that knowledge down to me. So um, I find it uh, kind of odd in Western academia, how we kind of really individualize uh, what we think knowledge is and that we don't uh, democratize knowledge and really invite that communal um, kind of contribution to whatever we're doing, right? Uh, even the idea of a CV I find is crazy, right? Because it's, you know, uh, we all have to, for, for a First Nations person, I grew up being comfortable with being forgotten. Mm. And in Western society, you want to be remembered. That's how the whole structure is set up. And what I've realized is that 
you know, I've grown up know, thinking it's sad that people want to be remembered because it is so futile. Uh, even kings get forgotten. Um, and I ask for some of my classes sometimes, I'll say, you know, there were roughly 5 billion people on the planet in 1900, name 10. Wow. You know, so we should be taking that em em energy that we're putting into being remembered into being a good ancestor. And that means living a good life now but also being mindful of those echoes of the ripples of our actions going forward. Some people are starting to get that with environmental stuff, but I worry that they're, they're conceptualizing it as climate change, which is just looking at the environment as a threat to us versus really understanding that as I posit in the breath of life model, that we are of the environment. Every First Nations creation story I've ever seen in Canada and those around the world always link up to the universe. There was always an, an understanding of what uh, physicists are now looking at now, like with the Big Bang theory and all the rest of that. Everything is open up into the universe. And so that's something that I think we need to think about in academia is really uh, we've settled into this pattern of wanting to be remembered and individual pr principal investigators in studies, which I think in many ways gets in the way of really welcoming communal knowledges. Well, and I think again, what where where you've identified the the individual or the community way of looking at things, and you know, even as in your talking, I heard you say, you know, that you're gifted, you know, in a communal way. This is a gifting that you're know, coming from that perspective is so important, and that's a mind shift. That's definitely a mind shift, and and with a mind shift, then different actions can happen. But if people start in a point where it's it's all about me, then their actions are going to be me. And I think in my own trajectory in terms of growing up, absolutely, I come from a Scottish background where you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and you know it's you know you, you know you, you you're in control. You've got to do this. And as I grew and evolved, I recognized that yes, there's me and I'm one in a community. And as I, you know, connect with other people, really hear about, you know, where other people didn't start that way. You know, as you started, that there's a starting point of I'm in community. And yes, I'm a part of the community to help. And I think this is why this model is so important to start looking deeper around how then do we utilize it, but also you had mentioned things around humility and just listening to you in terms of diversity. You know, these are things that are really important to us. And so the, the things that we value. And so I'm, I'm interested too, what are some of the other key values um, in the breath of life model that, um, that you see are really important? Well, I think uh, the humility is key. That whole idea about being a good ancestor. Um, I think this idea of interdisciplinary, it isn't, it isn't a option in the breath of life theory. You are by necessity interdisciplinary. Um, and so it, it doesn't obscure the reality that some things can be looked at with special attention. It just says that that special attention should never eclipse the in interdependent existence that we all live in. Um, I think there is this real, uh, sense of, I would say, almost peace in it. When you, the, when you come to peace with the idea that you are blessed and honored to be a small piece in a long continuum of history, it not only um, comforts you by knowing that you're going to be bookended by, this, by these different generations and not just the animal, uh, the people, but the whole world, the interdependent world, the universe, and uh, things will go on after you're done. Um, but it also is a source of responsibility. Because the one thing with the breath of life theory, and this is something that, you know, uh, family members and elders have told me, is that when you're given that oral history to sit with you, often it's our own insecurities that get in the way and obscure it. We think that we don't know it well enough, that um, you know, there's something about me, and well, what if I mess up and, and people don't agree with what I'm saying that stops us from breathing it forward. And it's 
in that when we stop breathing it forward, then future generations don't have that knowledge to gain. What we have to trust is that we have to honor this knowledge passed to us, but realize that it's not just our breath, that we're breathing together forward what we know and others will do the same. And we need to entrust that next generation and generations to follow to make sense of that. Um, so to give generously of who we are, to be in service of not just ourselves and our family or those we work with, but of the future generations that uh, we'll never know. You have to fall in love with the generation you'll never know. That's the key in the whole thing. Because um, if all you uh, look at, like with Maslow, is just one generation or uh, ecological theory, or even some of these things that stress you to say, well, think about your grandchildren. I don't think that's far enough. I think we have to fall in love with that generation that we'll never know and act in ourselves in an according way. And to be respectful, to respect that there's other knowledge systems. The breath of life theory isn't saying that no other knowledge system were, it matters and that Western knowledge doesn't have its place, far from it. I think that Western knowledge is more attuned to doing some things. Um, but I don't think it's got the, um, the architecture to deal with some of the problems that I think uh, the First Nations worldview can e more easily tackle. Questions about peace building, questions about uh, sustainability, uh, questions about what does it mean to really be human? Like at the end of the day, like I see all these people in Western society collecting stuff, right? Um, you collect a car, you collect a house, you collect all these things. Um, but then when I go to the cemetery, they're buried without all that stuff. So is that the value or is there something else about being a human being that what the Mohawks would call the good mind that we need to come back to, to really embrace our humanity and in that way, give the best of who we are as ourselves. And in social sciences and in management to really bring out the best of other people, right? Not see it as a competition all the time. And it, yes, and I wonder that sometimes in our organizations, especially with leaders too, is that bringing people together, it's, it's either, you know, set up as a competition or also, you know, coordination and sort of telling people what to do as opposed to real collaboration. I wonder if you have some thoughts on how I remember a friend of mine, he, uh, Gerald Craddock, who now is uh, teaches in the University here in Ontario. He, he really felt it was important to understand the difference between power and authority. Mm -hmm. uh, power is asserted and authority is given. What you want to do is lead by authority. And as Plato said over 2,300 years ago now, um, the first qualification of a good leader is not wanting to be leader. Um, and I have found in my own experience, this is kind of apart from the breath of life theory, but uh, there are two types of leaders primarily, people who wanna do something and people who wanna be someone. And you always wanna to try to avoid the be someone people um, because they are uh, folks who are more likely to uh, really be at that collector mode, uh, collecting of the titles, collecting of the credit and not giving space for the best ideas to come forward. So I think that there's ways of talking about leadership, certainly in, in the First Nations traditions, before the impacts of the band council system and all the rest of it, the leader's place was below the, the most struggling member of the community. It wasn't how high you were on the quote totem pole. It was actually, you were measured in your leadership about how low you were, because that's where you need to be to lift people up. Yeah, you, you've got my brain going in terms of, you know, even that whole concept of power. And, you know, often I use, I use the terms in terms of power, like a lot, I think for me, what I've heard, but people in, in some of the organizations where I've worked, power has been determined with authoritarian or, you know, authority. And so for me, it's, it's about influence. So I think we're saying the same thing when you sort of say, you know, power and authority, this is where I think sort of our, our languages and our words and, and how we can really dig deep to see how we're really talking is so important. And I think it is going, and again, I'm, I'm seeing your, your, um, your uh, mulberry bushes out where 
where we're kind of digging deeper as leaders is to really draw upon, yes, what is that, you know, authority and influence to sort of really be of service to people um, and, and how us thinking in these different ways can really help us move forward. So is there other things that you would suggest in terms of how leaders might draw upon the breath of life? Well, one thing is uh, that I'm hoping what it shows is that there is no cultural neutrality in Western thought. And I think that, that uh, we often uh, hear like, we'll make it culturally appropriate uh, in academia or business or whatever. And what my experience of that is, that's a very well-meaning effort, but what it really boils down to is let's take a Western management approach or a Western social services approach and throw in a totem pole and therefore it's done. There's none of this deep reflection on the ontological differences. And so I ask people to kind of experiment with applying the breath of life theory a bit to things in their everyday life. Like if you were to see something in a management context, what came the seven generations before that? Like what are the historical factors that led up to that? And then how are your decisions going to play out, not just the next quarter or next uh, fiscal year, but for seven generations down the line? What is that going to look like? And then when you look at the relational worldview principles, how would your decision making touch on these things? Um, is it going to set the system out of balance or is it in balance? And I think about environmental contamination as a way of that where this is really useful. Yeah, you might be able to employ people right now, uh, but think about those people living beside that tailings pond where you can't neutralize those carcinogens uh, with today's technology, say, you know, 40 years down the stream. Like that's kind of balancing that this kind of model invites. And I'm hoping it also invites some uh, reflection on how Western knowledge is actually constructed. I don't think we spend very much time in, in, um, in academia at all, really unpacking Western, the ontological thinking of uh, underpinnings of Western thought. We apply these theories and we say, though that's kind of our diverse way, but no one goes into weeds and sees, sees that. And I think in the ontology, it's the most interesting because that's where you start to see the opportunities, but the limitations of any knowledge set. So I'd say that that's really important. The other thing is, and it's, this is interesting, particularly for management and for leadership, is that the breath of life theory takes the fundamental position of abundance that there's enough for everybody. So uh, to put this in an environmental context that we could think about, um, I remember an elder saying uh, to a young environmental activist who came to his community, who was championing that there be a national park set up. He said, and he was wondering why the uh, elder wasn't enthusiastic about the park. Uh, the elder said to him, the whole world is the park. He said, the problem isn't, uh, you know, we don't need to have wildlife management or environmental management. What we need to do is manage our relationship to that environment. That's the problem. It's a human management issue. It's not a environmental management issue. Because if you approach it with the question of abundance, then you're not into this sense of scarcity that so much drives a lot of what we do in Western leadership and Western management. And that comes to power dynamics as well, right? When you realize that there's enough power for everybody, it's not a finite resource, right? You don't need to put other people on, your knee, on their knees in order for you to stand tall, right? Uh, and uh, so you, you would take it as a different view. You would say, look, I have this to contribute. They have that to contribute. What is my... Uh, what is my role as a leader to make sure that they can contribute the best of who they are to this question? And how do I make sure that I'm being, uh, humil I have the humility to not always be right, to actually be wrong, to invite people to make mistakes, to say uh, that insubordination can sometimes be a very good thing. Like it invites all that kind of thinking and questioning. I'm hoping it does anyway. No, I think you're absolutely right that it does in terms of there's that real juicy, juicy pieces in terms of even going deeper too in terms of saying, yeah, what, when we have this scarcity mindset, that there's, it's, our actions start to become fear driven too. Um, so it's like, oh, we start to close down where there's more of an opening up when, when we recognize there's, 
there's abundance. And so when you talk about unpacking ontology, um, one of the things in our executive leadership program is that we look you know, deeper and reflect on our own values in terms of those things that are really important to us. And then also looking at our you know, culture and our organizational culture, what you know, Edgar Schein, who's um, organization culture scholar in terms of talking about how we do things around here. And I think that's one of the things that I see that you're, the model that you brought forward as well has that structural aspect in terms of, I know for um, leaders in organizations, there's the real responsibility for setting vision and process and structures and policies. And, and so then we have to look at those, you know, structural risks in, in the fullness of the whole context and our own beliefs in terms of, yes, is there abundance? How, how might we move forward? Also in a way of hope, I think that a lot of, when you talk about thinking about for future generations, I think that a lot of, I mean, I have, I have uh, two, two young men and their sons in their twenties that, you know, there's a lot of not, a hope when I was growing up, there was a, a sense of possibility. Whereas I think some sometimes we're losing even some of those stories about that our world will be able to um, deal with some of these crises right now that we're experiencing with climate or you know um, that are happening. Yeah, and I think what often happens in Western thinking is there's a codification of structural risk as a personal deficit or as a uh, organizational deficit. And so we have, uh, say, uh, let's take a nurse in a healthcare organization. And, uh, you know, she's, she's not able to provide the level of treatment to the people. Uh, so she undergoes a performance review and people say, well, you're not able to do this, but no one's looking at the fact that she, no one's providing her with the resources in order to do that job to that ability or more broadly that health policy is actually not uh, attenuated for her to have success or health legislation. So I think this expansive worldview actually is very important for organizational leadership. It's critical. I think at, at this point, we definitely need new mindsets and new skill sets and capabilities, you know, not even this, to, to recognize that Yes, it's not about the, the individual, but it is about the whole, well, not only like we have a part to play and let's flip it um, yeah. in terms of this, this thinking in terms of community. Lovely. So any other, um, you know, things that you want to add, any, you know, messages that you might wish well, to leave with, with I, leaders? I would, I would just say that, you know, when I, and I was talking about this earlier with Kathy, is when I went, to publish this work, I thought it was peer reviewed, of course, and I always welcome peer review, right? It's always a good thing to learn how to read, write better, and you get some good critical feedback. So one uh, review was very, uh, very encouraging about this breath of life theory that, you know, we need to put it out there. Uh, there was some recommendations for some changes that were very helpful, and I did that. But the next review was very, very blunt, and it was a, like a one liner, this should never be published. And, um, there was no explanation as to whether what, why it should never be published. It would just should never be published. And I think when you are doing something new, you have to approach it with humility because you might be flat out wrong. But I also think that sometimes you strike a card in these systems where they just cannot fathom something like a theory of everything and all the social sciences. So it was rejected out of course. Um, I found that actually in my own writings that it's been those articles where I've got this kind of reflex back um, that have been the most popular and probably the most useful articles for others. And even the breath of life theory, uh, when I published it, uh, there wasn't a lot of take up back then. People were sitting back and thinking, well, this is, this is, this is not compatible with the way that I understand the world. And it was only really, really recently this last year where someone in Hawaii was looking at this kind of stuff and then started tweeting about it. And it got hundreds of thousands of tweets and people said, wow, this is exactly what we would find in our culture. And I have more ideas to build on it. Um, that's when it became popular. So just to say that if you get a, you know, this should never be published and the person cannot explain what they mean by that, don't be discouraged. 
Uh, and that sometimes when you're putting out these ideas, it takes a while for people to digest them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, wrong. It also doesn't mean that you're completely right. Uh, but we have to have the courage to contribute uh, these, these types of knowledges in ways that respect the knowledge holder. So I always am very careful not to uh, express sacred knowledge that isn't permitted by knowledge holders to be shared more generally. But I think we have to you know, put things out there and encourage people to pile on with their ideas and their critiques. It's by that stretching and pulling of knowledge and particularly when it comes to theory building, we have to do that as a communal exercise to get the best ideas. Anybody who do, does a theory and names it after themselves, I kind of think that's very limiting. <laughs> so I'm hoping that a lot of people will look at the theory, they will, they will critique it, they'll stretch at it, they'll pull it, they'll add to it, uh, but it'll create this um, community of people who will at least look at the idea of a theory of everything. Well, I, and I have to say, Cindy, that you also modeled the way for that. I mean, one, I, what I love your story because absolutely appreciate that not everybody will agree. And so you definitely need to have courage and to stand with your conviction and, and, and knowledge and, and, give, and desire to give. And also to then recognize, I had a colleague of mine who used to say, um, she, was from, she was from Argentina, she used to say, un momento para cada cosa, everything in its own time. Yeah. So, you know, it does sometimes take time for our, our ideas to root or the ideas to come to fruition or how they need to show up. And there's the need to constantly revisit. So even you have, you know, revisited this, yeah. to, like you wrote it back in 2011 and, and, and you've revisited it again in 2019. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. And like, I mean, I, I start to see things as uh, just taking new life. So I've been very influenced a lot by the equity research. And so that's kind of piled into my thinking since then. Um, and it is, uh, I think it, it, it's useful to understand that when we talk about um, theories in social sciences or in management, we're really talking only about Western theories so far. And I just think, you know, this experiment of mine about working with others to put out these ideas on the First Nations theory, that's only one of the very rem of the remembering cultures all over the world. And it seems to me that by kind of creating space for these other knowledge systems to come forward in our disciplines, we'll really be doing a service. But that means we also need to deconstruct the way that we actually can think about academia. For example, uh, we were talking about um, authority and power. One of the ways that power is carried out is by um, making exclusive knowledge that is really about the benefit of the collective. So you just keep it there and you control that knowledge and you express it in ways that make it inaccessible. And you dismiss people uh, who don't have that same kind of rhetoric or lingo that you talk about it in these finite spaces. So we, I think, you know, really thinking about what does this world mean for academia and the way that we understand academia and the spaces that we want to create to welcome these types of knowledges, I think is really important. And for just to give a very simple example, one of my uh, things that I think is pretty common for First Nations faculty across the country is that the universities will, uh, will value things like research. And by that, they mean very Western dominated research. Um, and they value teaching, uh, but they don't value service at the same level. And if you look at the breath of life model, that's actually one of the most important things. And uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit faculties often do a, are trying to struggle to meet all the Western criteria. And then on top of that, they're uh, expected to meet the First Nations, Métis and Inuit cultural requirements of them and try to be aligned with those ontological pieces. So it, it's almost an impossible juggling act that so many faculty have to do. And I, I don't think it's fair. Um, I think it's just that the system itself, the academic system doesn't realize how ontologically uh, um, embedded it is in a particular way of thinking and acting. Well, thinking, acting, seeing, relating, like all of those, those elements and that we really do have to, you know, start to unpack and continue to 
to share this knowledge further. Yeah. <sighs> Cindy, you know what? Oh, such a heartfelt welcome. You know, I, I really appreciate your time, the gift of communal wisdom that you've shared. I mean, as I said, it's so important for us to have these dialogues and keep having them and seeing how each of us can show up to really take a step toward, you know, making the world a better place because there's so much goodness out there and so much possibility. And that, you know, I really, for me, see how theory really helps us in our own practice to really make that kind of impact. Um, so I just want to leave today with any final words that, uh, that you have and leave you with the final words. I would say that when you next walk into a university and you pass by the chemistry building and you pass by the biology building and the physics building and the mathematics and the fine arts, that you actually stop and go inside. Because if you're in management, all of those ways of knowing have something to contribute to you. Same as when you walk by a First Nations faculty member or go to a First Nations gathering, those are all learning spaces for you if you're curious enough. If you wanna break down these kind of very, um, I would say limiting ways of thinking in management using that Western ontology, then walk through some doors that you haven't walked through before and be okay with being uncomfortable. It's when you're uncomfortable that you're learning something new. Ask yourself, what is it here in this space that I have an opportunity to learn? Vic, I invite you to shut the recording off so we can leave Cindy's words. <laughs>